Hello, Peter. Hello, Peter. How are you? Good evening, Rabbi. How are you? I am doing how very, very well. How was Yitzhak? Oh, he was amazing. Good. He was amazing. It's a great, he's a great storyteller and a great musician. And uh, I felt honored to be there. Good. I'm happy you enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah I, you had a great, you had an amazing seat too. Yeah. You know, because I knew it was going to be a story and I, I told yeah. Debbie, I'm like, we're going to get good seats for this. I wanted to be close. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was great. Oh my God. It was wonderful. And yeah, my mom and my aunt loved it too. They were right behind you. I don't know if you saw where they were. I did. Four, four rows directly behind you. Yeah. And then we were up just a, just a little bit of a ways, but it yeah. was fine. I was, you know, happier that my mom got to be up. And they were <laughs> wonderful with accessibility too, because I got there early and asked if um, they had, I mean, Shirley had like 10, whatever it was. And they said, if you have anything closer, she's very visually impaired. They were like, okay. And they got us something closer. So. Nice. Very nice. The only thing I would suggest to them is when they're playing the video to play the, to just show the captions on the bottom for the whole thing. Not just when the guy has the heavy Russian accent. Right. We can understand Yitzhak. I mean, he, you know, we get that, but not everybody understands that. And plus they should have access to it, you know? Yeah. Agreed. Hello, Maria Elisheva. Hi, Elisheva. Hello, Rabbi. Do you hear me? I do. Oh, great. Okay. I do. Instead of the recording, by the way, it's being, this is being recorded. So just, uh, you know, be careful of what you say, because this oh. is being kept for posterity. Uh oh. <laughs> Peter, that because might have been directed in the morning, at you. I was in a class and they couldn't hear me. Thanks a lot. So. I can, we can hear you now. Thank you. <laughs> Ali Sheva, Yashikach, and your and, um, Shira Shirma was so beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Diana. Rabbi, right. you're blinking. Or is it me? <laughs> I think it's you. I'm not blinking. <laughs> no, Sorry. The, the screen the screens are blinking. No, what it is is you're on the display settings. Um, it's not you're not in slideshow mode. I don't think oh, what on my iPad? No, 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 not no, not you, Rabbi. I don't know if it's in it's 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 split, it's a split screen. Yeah. That happened uh, once before, remember? No, I am in slideshow mode because I've got, I mean, it, it should be basically be, you know, you should see the thing, do we need God in the modern world? And then yeah. me in a smaller box. But no, syllabus no, no, no. It's hanging syllabus. to the right. Yeah, you've got syllabus hanging to the right and, and with your notes, but oh, you don't have to. Yeah, that happened once before. And then no notes. you had to like go out and then come back Hold in. Hold on, something. yeah, let me, let me reshare. I'm gonna now reshare. it stopped. I know, because I reshared yeah. it. Okay, good. Hi, Jack. All right, how about now? That's it. Better. Got it. Okay. <laughs> That's a Sistine Chapel? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And Dr. Bob wasn't even here to tell me that. <laughs> good to see you guys. Good to see you, everybody. We're gonna Alex, go see Jack, August. Hillary. The Cullies, got a few more people who said that they're coming. It is being recorded because I know a few people can't make it. So I, in these classes, I try to record. Mm. So. Oh, I need Monday recorded next week if possible. I sent you a text about Monday. Okay, I'll try. If not, that's I'll, fine. I'll, Yeah, it's harder to record the Mondays because it just takes up a lot of room. No problem. Monday <laughs> takes up more room than Tuesdays? <laughs> It does actually, because there's just, yeah, I don't know why, but it takes up a lot of room. I think it's just because of all the different slides that I have. Mm. But. Okay. Hello, Brooks. Hi, Brooks. Is Joanna with you? Hello, all. Joanna's at book club, so it's just me tonight. All right. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll give people uh, two minutes just to, since it's the first day. Did, did, did then... Ellen, did my friend Ellen sign up? I don't know. Going to. Okay. I, know if you had I don't know. Uh, you can always give I'll, her I'll the link. Her. I yeah, I sent her the information to register, which is me. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. It is uh it's good to see this group here. And I'm hoping 
with a, you know, kind of a one screen class, because, you know, when there's two screens, multiple screens, it's harder. But I'm hoping with a one screen class that we actually get a chance to have some conversation. Because I think with this topic, it's, you know, this is, this is all of us are going to have to weigh in on this subject, um, as opposed to me just saying yes or no, and then we can be done and click, you know, check it off of our list. Um, but as we, as we struggle with the idea of God in the modern world, we're going to ask ourselves a number of different questions. And hopefully there's going to be reflected in the syllabus, which now I'm going to share with you. Um, today, um, we're going to have a conversation about some of the traditional Jewish views of God and even some of the less traditional Jewish views of God. Um, some of you who may have been in some in my basic Judaism class for the theology section may have heard some of these uh, views, but we'll take them to another level. Next week, we're going to ask the question, how do we perceive God? Because if we can't perceive God, then the question of do we need God is kind of a, mute, a, a moot question. Um, then we're going to think about God as exemplar and God as source of wisdom. And we're going to talk about what that means for us. We're then going to think about God as support and God as consolation. And then finally, we'll come back based on everything that we know and everything that we've learned uh, over these. And the last class, we're going to uh, we're going to ask, well, so what do we think? Do we need God? And in what way? And how do we access that? And how do we, how do we have that relationship with God if we feel like we do? Okay. Any questions so far? Um, I don't believe we're skipping any Tuesdays. Um, and this is a five session class. Okay, then let's jump into it. So if we're asking the question, who or what is God, right? We need to say, so what is it that Jews believe of God? Because we can have this question in a lot of different religious formats, and we're going to get different answers. And so for us, this is not a comparative religion sort of class, although there may be times that we utilize other religions to compare our perspective. I really want to dig into what is the Jewish perspective of God and what is a classic understanding of what we think Jews believe about God. And so I want to ask that question of you now, and I want us to kind of throw out some things that we may think about as classic understanding of Jewish view of God. That God is everywhere. God is you everywhere, right? Omnipresent. You don't, you don't have to go to shul to find God. He's everywhere. Well, let's not say that too loud because we like people coming to shul. But yes, that is true. Um, right? God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. Okay. Good. What else? Thank you, Roberta. What else? Are you looking for God and in terms of the creator concept? Or are Maybe. you looking? Are you looking um, at an omnipresent kind of, you know, apparition? You know, whatever you want to define it as, or, or are you looking at it like the Big Bang theory? You know, it's, I'm you know, I'm looking for whatever you think, <laughs> right? Or, I don't know there's any I'm, right I'm looking here. at God really is almost as a moral code of okay. where we a moral are. Moral code, a moral compass. Good. I like that, right? And there is only and there is only one God. Good. Let's start with monotheism, yes. right? A fundamental Jewish belief is there's only one God. Right. Good. Diana. I think God is is part of a relationship. And um, that which there, I guess to that point, like I think of the poem, each of us has a name and 
God is no different. There are so many different names for God. And there's like that personal God we kind of know about from Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov. Like these aren't just words that are added for no reason. Each one of our patriarchs had a different relationship with had God. Had a unique individual relationship with God. So God, you said two things, which I think are important. First of all, God is relational, right? That God is a being with whom we can, should, might have a relationship with. Um, and the second piece is that those relationships might be very unique um, or very individualized. And then the in third the same thing I'm going to say right. was uh, 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 share, um, yeah, share, yeah. Like, I basically, I mean, he himself says to Moses, like, yo, bro, like, I am what I am, you know? Right. Right. And then there's this aspect of, of this temporal aspect of, of past, present, and future, which I think if we dissect Adon Alam, king of the world, I mean, we really see all of these different facets there as well. So very multifaceted, okay. nice, Anna. Complicated, nice, Anna. complicated relationship. Peter. Yeah, I. it's been running when I signed up for the class. Uh, Joan Osborne's song, um, What If God Were One of Us, okay? And I know it comes at it from a Christian perspective because she talks about the saints and the prophets in there. But, you know, it's always, we all are looking for this personal, as Diana said, a personal relationship with him. Um, rabbis help guide that for sure, but I think what's unique about our perspective is that we can have a personal relationship with God that other I don't think exists in other faiths. So Peter, and there's another aspect. Unique... Yeah. So Peter, there's another aspect to what you're saying, which I think is also important, and we're going to see in one of our sources today, which is, you know. There's a connection between us and God. There's a similarity in some way between us and God. And we're going we're gonna to talk about it. So the, if, you know, what if God were one of us is, is kind of the, the way that, 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 that she phrased the question. But maybe we need to phrase the question is, what if we were like God? Mm -hmm. But we are. Right? We're supposedly created in that image. Good. And we're going to talk go about back, that. Go back to the original premise of what you what the class's title was okay what's the title of the class peter just make go, go ahead and make your point my my point is god needs us just as much as we need god good good okay which is my overall point okay, we need good. him he needs us and it's we're, a relationship we're in a relationship and yeah. a symbiosis really yeah because it, it has to be. Brooks. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things that I find fascinating in Judaism is we're obviously we're, we're strict monotheists in, in Judaism, but God has a, has different natures and, and, a, and different uh, manifestations uh, in a relationship. So um, at times God can be angry, right? He takes on almost anthropomorphic qualities. Uh, he can be, you know, angry or he can, you know, bless us. And then there's a time when he's, you know, a spirit and can, you know, he's the Shekinah and it comes down as the smoke over, you know, over the you know, Ten Commandments, over Mount Sinai and things like that. So the nature, the, the actual nature of God changes a lot uh, throughout, throughout the Torah. And it, it's hard, hard to grasp sometimes for me, but there's something there, some meat on the bones. I don't know. How yeah, I no, I like that. I thought when you were talking about smoke, I thought you were going to go for the smoke on the water metaphor, but that's a different mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. Um but, but, you know, one of the things that I've taught and I've, I've said in my sermons a, a number of times, right, is when we talk about God as a relationship, because relationships are individual, two people who have relationships with the same third person are going to describe that differently. And the way I phrased it yes. before is, look, you know, if you ask me to describe my mother and my sister to describe her mother, you're going to get very different descriptions. Different people. Right? Because it's based on the relationship. And now the reality, which I think is what I wanted to get to with this, is neither of us are actually describing her in totality. And maybe 
none of us can describe God in totality because all we see is a part, right? Maybe that's what the meaning of the verse was when Moses asks God, let me see you. And God says, no human being can see all of me, right? You can only see a part of me. I'm going to show you my back. I'm going to show you part of me because that's all we can, we can, in our relationship, we can see a part. But, right, if, if we're able to gather my part and Brooks's part and Elisheva's part and Roberto's part and Judy's part and everybody's part together, now we start to see a much broader picture of what God is. And we're going to talk about that too a little bit later too. All right. Um, we're going to look at some sources because if we're going to talk about classic Jewish views of God, let's look at some sources. And for these sources, there are going to be four of them. For these sources, I want us to answer two different questions. One, Rabbi, what is, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just let me, uh, my, my, I have problems with beauty. No worries. Uh, my situ, my view of God is, is a little bit different. I'm very influenced by, sorry, can you say that? By Isaac Asimov and his idea of psychohistory. I view God as, so, as something that manipulates, that's able to manipulate probabilities. Okay. And, and we can't manipulate those probabilities, but God does. And that's okay. the action of God um, in the manipulation of probabilities. Um, so, so we talk about that a little later, but, but that really has had a big influence on me because I see So, okay. Thank you, Jack. Th 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 thank you, Jack. I, I think it's certainly not a classic view of, of a classic traditional view because Asimov is a much more modern perspective on it. But let's keep that in mind, kind of as we go through our different classes, and have you be that voice of. So when we talk about God as consoler, or talk about God as presence, or talk, how does that play in, or does it not play in? And we can think about that as it goes. Good. All right. So two different questions that we're going to ask. One is, what does the um, what does the source tell us about God? And the second question is, what does it tell us about our relationship with God? Those are two different ideas and two different questions. Okay. So I'll read the first one, and then you can raise your hands. Um, if you want to answer either of those uh, of those two questions as we go. This comes from Genesis chapter 1, right? Verse 26 and 27. And God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creepy things that creep on the earth. And God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I chose in this just because it's very a classic text um, to keep all of the gender pronouns the way that the Hebrew has it originally. Um, we can have a conversation about that and whether or not God has a gender, how that's reflected. But for at least the, the translation, I just kept all the gender pronouns the same. So what do we learn about God? And what do we learn about our relationship with God? Diana? I mean, I think, I think straight out of the gate, he's, uh, he's uh, going into a third, into a first person plural, not a se. So let us make man. Like, I don't think he's talking us like me, myself, and I. Uh, <laughs> the royal I think, we? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know what Rashi has to say. It's been, you know, right. Well, but I think like right away, it's like, okay, so we're kind of going to, we're going to do this together. Let us make man after our likeness okay. um, about really respecting all that is created. I mean, it's really pretty relevant today, you know, about the fish and you know, the sky, the cat, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, all the, even the, even the little creepy things that, that can make someone impure, even those, those, the sherets that can impart tuma, like, 
even that's still like part of it. He's not certainly not sanitizing the world for us. He's putting all these things out there and then we kind of have to decide what, what to do once we have all that stuff, but that's another okay. conversation. Good. Peter. I love that the first thing he does is really set up a hierarchy uh, where God makes us in his image and then puts us as boss over the dominion on earth. Um, but what kind of always has thrown me in Genesis is the concept whether we're, and this is a hard concept, is are we alone in the universe? You know, this is kind of saying that we are and uh, that it's so, setting up yeah, the Peter, earth. I mean, you know, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's going to take us a little far afield from this particular topic this doesn't mention anything else, but it also doesn't preclude it. That's right. not to say that God can't have made other worlds, other worlds well. and other existences, right? But it's always a on this struggle. world, right? On this world, this is what we've got. Elisheva, um, Rabbi, if I read this the first time, and I know nothing else, the simplest thing I find here is. We are assistants to God who created this world. And the other thing is like, I look like God because Good. I was made in his image. So that's just what I get from here. Beautiful, Elisheva, right? Three things. One, I'm actually going to do it in reverse order. Number mm -hmm. one, God is the creator, right? Number two, we have some sort of a likeness right? B'Tselem, right? A picture, an image. We're created in the image of God. So there is something about us that is similar to God. Now, whether it's our physical forms, right? I don't personally see that. Whether it's the, the image, whether it's our spiritual image, our spirit that is in the image of God, but there's something about us that is in God's image, that is like God. Um, and then a number of people mentioned it, and Peter started with it, this idea of a hierarchy. It comes along with being a creator. So God is on the top, right? Then comes all the creations. And God has deputized us to be on the, hier on the top of the hierarchy here on earth, but God is on the top. And there is that hierarchical division between us and between God. This is not about equals here. This is about creator and created. And even though we're in the image, we are not the same. Okay? Good. Next source also comes from Torah. This comes from the book of Leviticus. We're going to be reading it in a few weeks, right? Kedoshim tihi u ki kadosh ani Adonai Elohechem. Speak to the whole Israelite community and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. What does it mean? What does it mean about God? And what does it mean about our relationship with God? All right, now, now the hands are going up. Elisheva, go ahead. Well, the simplest thing I can say is, mm -hmm, I'm different from all the rest of the creation. So I have something um, to feel like very important because I am Kadosh and God is Kadosh. So it's like bringing me to a kind of a society, the partnership, right? Okay, so this is this is taking away some of the hierarchy or allowing us to maybe come on more similar levels through this idea of kedusha, through this idea of holiness, right? We have a we have a common playground, so to speak, common playing field that um, that we can we can work with God on. Good, uh, Diana. Um, I think it's important to, I think, really translate 
the Hebrew a little bit more strongly than I guess Safaria does because it would be more complicated that way. Mm-hmm. So first thing we're dealing with is the whole concept of Kehila Kedosha, which is a a holy like a, a community, a, a, a Kehila, or here they use the word Adat Bnei Israel. And it says El Kol Adat Bnei Israel, like to the whole Israelite community. So we already are like saying, okay, now Moses, go, don't, don't go, go speak to like, you know, take off Peter and Elisheva and Brooks off to the side and have these little one-on-ones. It's like, you can picture you're talking to the whole, you know, everybody in giant stadium, you know? <laughs> and then he says, Amarta Alehem, say to them, we got this part. Kedoshim tihi you, and that's the really important part. It's you shall be holy, and it's it's second person plural. So yeah. he's yeah, not. I mean, if, and, and if we were in the we south, we would say help. y'all yeah. shall be y'all. Holy. Right? I mean, I, I, I wish the far. Yeah, I wish we. I wish we had a better word in English for for right. you for you plural because it, it, it's yeah for you that's, right. My cousin Vinny, right. <laughs> you guys Use shall be holy. <laughs> so I think that that's that's really important when we talk about um the whole path the whole road really from where we you sort of started at Bereshit at the beginning now we're you know fast forward we go go through the desert all this stuff and now we get to Vayikra Leviticus we're getting the the laws the whole the the, the I guess the holiness code if you will right and so that's all part of this relationship that there are are laws in this relationship too like all relationship has marriage has rules and well, parents but, but and children. I want to go back to what you were yeah. saying earlier because I think it's it's really the crucial piece here is that you know we talk about relationship, but this is not a one-on-one relationship solely, and maybe not at all from this perspective, right? The fact that this is the plural and this is the community, this is a communal relationship that we have, and that colors the way we think as Jews about how we engage with God. There's no doubt right? That's not to say that I as an individual can't have an individual relationship with God, but being Jewish is about being part of a communal relationship with God as well. And if you separate that out, I think we have a problem. We have a problem. All right, two more comments, Peter, then Jack. Um, I think the word we were looking for is covenantal relationship with God here. This is what this paragraph has always said to me is that because you are in this relationship, okay, it's a special set of bonds and they, they're like silk bonds. They stretch, they bend, but you're in that relationship and there is no way out. This is something that we have as a responsibility since Sinai. Um, we can't get out of this relationship whether we want to or not. Good. It, we're bound into it. Good. I like that. Jack. Um, my, I'm going to be a contrarian again, but it's okay. Uh, my, my problem is this, this particular statement that doesn't mean much to me because I don't know what holy means. Mm. It's, it's it is. definition. Yeah, look, it's definitely an issue. And when I teach this actually with, with kids and, in, and, and when I have more time, we actually do a unit on what holiness means, right? And, and, and very often holiness means distinct or separate or unique or special. Um, those are all words that can kind of come into holiness. But I agree with you. Until we find out what holiness means, it's hard to really dig down into this particular text. Um, what I would say is, if, if the first source is hierarchical, this source is more partnership oriented, right? The first source is about separation. This source is about coming together, right? I'm God, the creator, you're the created. Okay, now I'm holy, but you can be too. Here's what we can share together, right? Here's, here's what we can both do this in the world. We can both bring holiness into the world, whatever it means, right? Whatever it means. Good. All right. Next source. We're going to do two sources now from the Talmud. 
And the first source is from Masechet Huli, and it reads as follows. The emperor Hadrian once said to Rabbi Joshua ben Hanania, I want to see your God. You cannot see him, answered the rabbi. The emperor insisted. So the rabbi had him face the sun during its height and said to him, look up at it. I cannot, he answered. If you cannot even look at the sun, which is just one of God's attendants, said Rabbi Joshua, how do you presume to be able to look at the divine presence? What does this tell us about God? And what does this tell us about our relationship with God? It's a tougher one. I have a thought. Go ahead, Judy. Um, this is saying, you know, we cannot see God we need to carry God within us. We, we need to have, think of the presence of God being within each of us. I agree 100% with the first half of your statement. I like your response to it, which is let's carry God within us, but I don't know that it says it here. I actually think you're 100% right, Judy, on the first piece, which is like, we can't there's 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 this distance we can't actually see god we can't actually connect in some way with god right and it doesn't give us an answer for how we then have a relationship right um elisheva then diana elisheva i'm sorry you're muted (laughs) sorry um, i said oh god I don't know if I'm seeing this too sim- in a very simple way. I understand it very, very uh, easy. It's coming from the first source. We were created. We are partners. Uh, w- second, we are holy. Whatever holy means, we share that with God. Oh, but wait a second. There's still, yet there is something different. We are not as equal, right? And we can, and we have to, to not to, it's very simple to say, I want to see God, but it's more like, more than that. It's more like, I want to see physically uh, God, right? So we, we have to, uh, we have to understand that God is so special that it's not, we, we, as humans, we cannot see God. So, but but I wouldn't keep it, I, I hear what you're saying, Elisheva, but I wouldn't keep it just in the physical. Because look, I've spoken to lots of people in moments in their life where they're saying, I just want to feel God's presence. I, 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 I feel abandoned. I feel lacking. I feel, right? And so this, this separation, right, I think is a, is a powerful thing that we need to understand as part of our relationship with God in a different way than creator created, which I, is hierarchical. I, I agree, that's not what I feel, but according to the texts and for a person that is just reading it or learning it, uh, it goes like in a process, right? And, and Or a child, he's, he's, the child is not going to feel immediately this uh, God inside, right? I don't yeah. know, some do. Actually, well, yes, but <laughs> actually, the children have a much easier time with it than us. All right, hang on, I'm gonna let yeah. Nancy speak, and then I wanna, I wanna just bring one more thing, and then keep moving. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay. Well, the thing that bothers me about this particular seg- segment or section here is that um, it's harmful. I mean, if you use the analogy of looking at the sun, that's something that can actually do you damage blinded um and and the, it, it bothers me that i mean that seems like it's creating barrier between yes you and god yeah no i think 100 percent, nancy like i i think this source is about distance it's all about distance it's about reflecting a jewish belief that god is infinite right god is the infinite we human beings are finite. And the reality, the truth of the situation is 
the finite can never fully perceive the infinite. That's right. Right? It's impossible. We can't do it. Now, the question that we're going to ask is, so then what do we do? Right? It's interesting. Rambam actually reflects this in a very interesting way, right? He says, the second you try to define God, you're wrong. Because God is infinite and therefore undefinable. As soon as we try to put limits, we're going to be wrong. Now, he says, some people say, well, if I can't understand God fully, then why bother? I'm going to turn my back and I'm going to go in a different direction. Right? There are other people, however, who say to this, I know I'm never going to fully understand God, but I'm going to understand as much as I can. And that's going to be my relationship. And what I understand and what you understand and what somebody else understands may be different. But that's part of that relationship. And all too often, I, li I like this source because I think it, it reflects two realities to us. One is that we're never going to know everything. Right? But if we say we're, we need to know everything or else we're not, well, that ends the conversation. That ends the conversation. That distance is inherent. There are going to be times that we feel distant from God, that we feel we don't get it, we don't understand, we don't know, because that's built into the nature. Rabbi, it seems to me, and I'll just take a second, that that distance creates huge issues of trust and doubt of for all of us in this modern world. Of course, because, it'd be great if we all had a little burning bush to kind of prove to us, oh yeah, this is right. what it is. I'd right. take one in a second. Maybe a splitting of the Red Sea, maybe just my pool, right? Something, right. something to show to get rid of that doubt, right? right. But, but, but what I think Judaism is saying here is that doubt is built in. It's inherent into our relationship with God. And if we're going to insist that that doubt doesn't exist, I understand. We're going to have a problem. Now, that's going to be balanced by Kadoshim Tihiyuki Kadoshani. You can be holy. And we're in the image of God and we're like God, right? All of these different sources are coming to give us different aspects of our relationship. But this is, this is a hard one, but it's an important one. Right? Um, I, I'm going to hold off on the comments because just because I want to get to, I just want to get to the, to the next piece. If, if Kadoshim to you, be holy, is sort of the response to the distance and the hierarchy of the creation, then what's the response to this, right? What's the response to God is distant and we're never fully going to be able to understand God except through our own lens? I believe this next source is our response to that, right? It's also from the Babylonian Talmud. It comes from a Sechet Sota, and it reads as follows. What is the meaning of the verse? Follow none but the Lord your God in Deuteronomy 13.15. Is it possible, should be for a human being, to actually follow the ways of God, right? We're finite. God's infinite. What it means is that we should imitate the attributes of God. As God clothed the naked, as it is written, the Lord made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them, so should we clothe the naked. As God visited the sick, as it is written, the Lord appeared by Abraham to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre, so should we visit the sick. As God comforted the mourners, as it is written, after the death of Abraham, God blessed his son Isaac, so should we comfort the mourners. And as God buried the dead, as it is written, he buried Moses in the valley, so should we bury the dead. What is the response to that distance? The response is that we bring God into this world by emulating those attributes, those attributes that we can emulate those things that we can do, we can do. And in a really real, in a real way, right? This brings God here. When we do this, we are acting godly. We are bringing God into this world. If we turn our back on these things, 
then in in essence we are we are alienating god's presence from the world by not doing these things so the distance is there but the power to bring god close is ironically in our hands yes through the things that we can do and i i think you know these these sources sort of all go together right we've got the first source and the response, the second source of the response, if we, if we think about them, right, we've got God as creator, God as source of holiness, right, is the response. God is infinite and beyond comprehension to God through our actions, the response. When people say, you know, what, what is the classic view of God, classic Jewish view of God, these are the sources that I teach. This is, this is the classic view of God. It's not monolithic. It's multifaceted. It's complex. Because just like any relationship we have, it's going to be complex. Now, what's interesting is, in addition to these classic sources, there are actually new ideas that we can sort of use to describe, to explain God, right? Um, so some of you have heard me talk about these before. There are actually archetypes that we can use to describe our relationship or how, uh, how we, how we relate to God. Um, we have the hermit. Um, and when I teach it, I always ask, you know, well, what do we know about this and how does it define God? Well, the hermit is somebody who separates themselves from everyone else, Right. Um, if we think about God as the archetype of a hermit, well, that is God really doesn't have anything to do with us anymore. Maybe God did once, but now maybe God is off, uh, you know, tending to all those other worlds, Peter, that we were talking about, right? Um, uh, maybe God has other things. Maybe we just, maybe God doesn't care anymore, right? We hear this archetype a lot with people who, Many, with some people who survived the Holocaust, right? Or survived tragedy, right? Where was God? I, or even survived illness, um, right? I felt alone. I felt abandoned by God. Um, and this is an archetype that is part of, of, our, of, of our relationship with God. But yet we, the Essenes all took this and a lot of the aesthetic uh, facets of Judaism called for, you know, called for going to the desert and being alone. And Moses was alone. And he, well, you but, know. but no, I, I disagree, Peter, because it's, it's being alone from people, but not being alone from God. But right? we can never be alone from God. Well, but the hermit, but we need to be, have that relationship. So the hermit, the hermit ideology here is actually reflecting a sense of abandonment a sense of distance and a sense of lack of God's presence, right? Which I think is real for people. It's real for people. It's not the ideal, right? Certainly not the ideal relationship, but you know, there are a lot of people who feel that. My grandfather was very much that way, right? After the Holocaust, right? Then you've got the other side of that. Oops, sorry. Right, I already had it here, which is the puppet master, right? That's God's pulling all the strings, right? We hear that in Jews. We hear that in, fundam in other, other religions, mm -hmm. right? Where we talk about what's well, all part of God's plan, right? Um, it's all part of God's plan. That's the puppet master. Nothing happens without God saying, this is what's going to happen, right? Um, and when we talk about, for example, the problem of evil or why bad things happen. This is a challenge. The hermit, you know, if a baby dies of cancer, God forbid, in the hermit, we can say, well, God wasn't there. God didn't care. Fine. I can't blame God for that. Right? But if God's a puppet master, if God's pulling all the strings, then how do we deal with that? Right? Maybe we say, oh, well, um, you know, God, God has a larger plan. We may say that 
God wanted to bring this soul into God's presence, right? There's all sorts of ways that we try to, to deal with that, but it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenging way to think about it. Nancy. Yeah, well, this is basically free will versus determinism. Yeah, yeah. well, yes. I mean, we're going to see actually free will breaks a lot of this stuff. But yes, um, Puppet Master is very predetermined. Uh, in everything, if I'm walking across, you know, the, 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 the stage and I fall, it's because God wanted me to, you know, to, to, that, to that detail. Okay. Um, okay. Now, Judy mentioned this uh, earlier, right? The last paradigm or archetype that we have is of a watchmaker, right? A watchmaker creates the watch, builds the watch through skill, through, through knowledge that nobody else has, right? Sets the watch to go and run, and then lets it run. And the watch works that way because that's the way a watch works, right? Um, the second hand ticks, not because the puppet master is moving the second hand every single second, but because a watch is built to have the second hand go every second, right? And what's interesting is if the watch gets damaged, maybe we can bring the watch back to the watchmaker, but the watchmaker isn't gonna come knocking on all of our doors saying, you know, I feel like you haven't come in for a while. Let me come repair your watch, right? It's up to us to bring that watch back to say, hey, we need, it needs to be fixed. And if we take a hammer to it and smash it into smithereens, well, the watchmaker may say, there's not much else way I can do for that. Or at a certain point in time, the watch just isn't gonna work anymore. So these are archetypes. And what I would say is very few people, if any, are just one of these. The reality is we all have all of these in us and they come out at different times depending on what's happening in our life. Sometimes we feel the presence of God and the hand of God really sort of guiding us, moving us through almost like that puppet master. Sometimes we feel the lack of presence of God, right? Sometimes we sort of see everything kind of coming together and say, okay, this is the way the world works. And depending on what's happening in our life, and I've actually been at the bedside of, of people in the hospital, for example, and they've cycled through all three of these in a matter of seconds, right? Seconds, because these are emotionally connected based on how we're feeling and how we're perceiving the world at any given time. Peter. Are you back to the four sons is my question, really. No, I don't, I don't because, see a connection but, here. But, yeah. but, because to me, we all have all these attributes and pieces of us. And at different points in our lives, we, we can fall into any of these camps. And I, I, I see it myself, you know, yeah. that there when I was very ill, uh, you know, 17 years ago, it was a near death experience. And I've spent the better part of the last 17 years thinking about my encounter. And I'm convinced that it was, you yeah. know, I, I was in that presence and I still wake up and sometimes you know i understand it and sometimes i shudder from it at the same moment you know that i was even there that's a good segue actually into the last piece that we're going to be talking about right but i want to hold for a second and just summarize what we've got here and then we'll get to that last piece with peter i think is a, is a, is a direct segue into what you're saying so we talked about four different sort of ways to conceive of God through our Jewish texts. We've talked about three different archetypes that sort of function with one another in some sort of a mix and a cocktail, right? Within each one of us at any given moment that may change. But it ultimately comes down to those moments, Peter, right? It comes down to those moments. And many of you 
have heard me over the years speak about the idea of the God of moments, right? That we perceive God as human beings through moments. If we can't perceive of God in God's entirety, right? We've established that. Then we, we can perceive God through moments in our lives. And I've talked about it in various times. I mean, I actually use, I often use the Unatanatokev prayer from uh, High Holy Days to talk about the two different uh, sort of sounds that God may, or, or that, 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 that are made out there, right? The kol shofar gadol, this big cosmic shofar, right, that's blown, or the kol dmama deka, the, the sound of thin silence. And I talk about it in terms of these moments in our lives, you know, we don't often have those big trumpeting moments in our lives. Some of us do, by the way, right? And I talk to people and I say, here it is, you know, this moment, this was a Red Sea moment for me. It was pretty obvious, right, of God's presence. But many of us don't have it. If we do have them, they don't happen very often. But, the, but these quiet moments in our lives, they actually happen all the time. The problem is we're usually making too much noise to actually hear them, right? And if we want to see a quiet moment or feel a quiet moment, we actually have to calm ourselves. We have to open ourselves up to it in order to be able to say, oh, this is a moment. This is a moment. I'll share one with you. Some of you have heard it before. I'll share one with you in a moment. But first, Diana. I think to your point about moments, time is incredibly important in Judaism, this whole concept of moed and time, wherein the rabbis instituted different God moments, if you will, through prayer, where yeah. it's been organized. It's where it's kind of like, okay, if you're not going to do it yourself, we're going to build it in for you. And we're going to, you know, so now you've got Shacharit, you've got your morning prayers, you've got Mincha in the afternoon, you've got Mariv in the evening, and then you've got Shmal Himita, you've got your, your evening prayers. But it's and even it, more than that, right, Diana? Oh, is for sure. All the brachot that we say. I was, was going to say that. And when we eat, and when, before yeah. we eat, and after we eat, and after you go to the bathroom, I mean, there are, you, you know, they say like 100 blessings a day. You, you could go on and on and on. But a I bracha think, is about capturing moments. Exactly. That's and what it, a bracha does. And it's, it, and it's acknowledgement. It's acknowledging. It's part of that relationship that we talked about in the very beginning. And sometimes the brachot go to creation, which was your very first point, bore, pariha gafen, like creator of the fruit of the vine. Like, right. yeah, like, okay, it's had to start somewhere, you know? And yeah, we're planting our own seeds and all, you know, you can go through all that whole thing. But I think, I think for me, a very easy way to kind of, just pop that moment in is you just wake up every day and you say modani and it doesn't mean that your your day is going to be perfect i mean frankly your day could suck right. <laughs> but hey you're in the game because you woke up so you're there and so you may as well it's take a good that start. moment <laughs> you may as well take that moment and say thanks pal for giving me the opportunity to to either or, you know, ride the wave and enjoy what's going to come or fight, right. put, put on my suit of armor and fight through the challenge, you know, and you go to bed at night and you're like, wow, thanks God. I made it. I hope to see you in the morning. Yeah. So we got all these, all these opportunities. That's what I was getting at. What the is God? Is, God is opportunity. <laughs> the question is, how do we see them when they're there? Because our mind, especially those of us who have grown up in the scientific world, right. Who've grown up you know, if you grew up in the religious world, you're sort of trained to, to sort of capture those moments. But if you're not, if you don't haven't grown up in, a, in the religious world, if you've grown up in a more secular world in the 20th century, 21st century, it's harder. And, and how do we get ourselves to actually capture them? Because our mind will instantly say, oh, no, that really wasn't a moment of connection to God. That was something else, right? And... Um, I mean, I'll share with you, you know, one of my formative moments, and some of you have heard me, those of you who have been here for 20 years probably have heard me talk about this before, but um, when I was a, a chaplain in the hospital at NYU Medical Center, I was in rabbinical school, and it was my first, my very first unit of chaplaincy, and I, um, I worked on a floor at NYU uh, Medical Center, it was actually a very unique floor. Most, for those of us who've been in hospitals, we know 
one of the biggest challenges of a hospital room is there's absolutely no sense of self or privacy, right? People walk in all the time, anytime, all days, you know, all day of the, uh, and, and you don't have that sense of this is my space, right? This is, it, it's constantly being invaded. It's constantly coming in. And so what NYU tried to do is they created a floor that had basically apartments instead of rooms. And these were for people, obviously this doesn't work for an ICU setting, but most of the people that were there, and this was um, in the 90s um, when this was going on, when I was in rabbinical school, and, and most of the people that were in the room were either people who were dealing with cancer or dealing with AIDS um, at the time. Those were the people that were in those rooms at the time. And so they would be in their rooms, they would be there with a care partner who would live with them, a spouse or a sibling or a friend, anybody, right? And then for their treatment, they would come into the treatment room and then they'd go back. And unless there was, God forbid, an emergency, nobody went into your room. And it created that sense of personal space. And it really was amazing. So anyhow, I was I was working on, on that floor. And um, that day, we I was in something called IPR, which is Interpersonal Relations Seminar. Um, this is what we as chaplains do. We get together and we talk. And the best way I can explain it is it's sort of between a cross between group therapy and the Spanish Inquisition, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's really like digging deep. It's other chaplains that are there that are, that are trying to really kind of push you to, 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 to see it. And this was my day to sort of be out there. And, and frankly, I was in a bit of a, of a, of a mood and I was, railing against how unfair it was that um that here i am devoting my life to god and you know here i am i'm no i'm no more sure about god's presence than anybody else right i don't have any proof like i said a little burning bush would be nice something like that and and that's kind of where i was and i was really frustrated with that and 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 how am i supposed to go and serve these people if i'm not even sure myself and all of these sorts of things and Anybody who's been through group therapy knows that usually the way it ends is they say, okay, time's up, right? It doesn't mean you've come to any conclusions, right? So after the hour, I've come to no conclusions and time was up and I had to go back to work. And I went up to my floor and I met with a young man who was living with AIDS and he was really struggling. And I was sitting and I started speaking to him and he started asking me the very same questions almost verbatim that I was just asking in interpersonal relations seminar. And it was one of those moments and I still get a chill down my back when I remember it, right? And I sort of felt like God was saying, okay, you wanna play, let's play, right? You wanna start asking questions? Let's flip it around, right? Now, you're, now you need to answer these questions. Now you need to respond to somebody who's in pain not just be childish about it, right? And, and respond. And it was one of those moments in my life that I felt like God was, like the phone was ringing and it was just for me to pick up the phone and say, okay, let's, let's have this conversation. And of course, you know, I went up afterwards and I said this to, to my supervisor and, and, um, and she's like, and I said, well, you know, of course it was coincidence because what, of course, what else would he ask, right? And she really pushed me to, to say, why do you think it must be coincidence? Maybe not. Maybe that was a moment. Maybe that was open yourself up to those moments. And yeah. it changed the way that I sort of view the world. And I view moments in my life. And as these moments come together, they start to coalesce. And if we think about it as a pointillist painting, right? When we're looking up close at that painting, all we see is a bunch of dots. But as we collect more dots and as we start to get some perspective, we start to see the image that those dots mm -hmm. portray. And so when we think about God as a God of moments, we think about it in this way. The more moments we can collect, the more moments we identify, the more we're going to be able to say, this is with whom we're having the relationship. All right, Peter. I don't see the woman who spoke to you's um, answer at all. I see that as a God moment. 
totally the that's what she was saying i was actually saying it was coincidence she was saying i I can't i can't listening to that i can't say it's coincidence you know from where where i've been i i think i think you know you know um we plan and god laughs at it you know i I actually just quoted that that, to somebody i think he god was was laughing at you because you were questioning it well and it, look at it it opened up a conversation in me that ultimately led me to become a chaplain and ultimately led me to become the rabbi i am today and i mean it was formative in my in my development in who i am and how i see the world it it's very scary to be in that i wrote in the chat um, you know, stopping one's internal dialogue to hear those quiet moments. You know, I read Carlos Castaneda, you know, 50 years ago almost now, and learning learning that you can stop your internal dialogue is a miraculous thing, and it doesn't happen very often. Well, and look, you we're can't struggling yourself into it. Yeah, Peter, look, we're struggling today just to be able to be quiet long enough to let somebody else have a, you know, yeah. speak in, in, in dialogue with other people, let alone with God and, and other things. Any questions on this? Because I want to I want to be, uh, be be conscious of our time. We just have a couple more minutes. Any questions? And then we'll we'll sort of shift. This is sort of the the, the basis. What I wanted to do is to today give some tools for us to think about what God is to us right? Which of these sources that we had in the beginning speak loudest to you? Which of those paradigms, those archetypes speak loudest to you? Have you had moments in your life that you can say, wow, these are divine moments, or maybe moments that now you can reflect on and say, well, maybe they were, and maybe they weren't, and I should investigate that a little bit more. I should look into that a little bit more, so I can start to do that, right? Next week, we're going to try to ask and answer the question, at least from a traditional perspective of how do we how do we perceive god um you know you don't always get that phone call um for me one of the reasons i do what i do one of the reasons i teach one of the reasons that i enjoy these types of classes is i hear god that last source of the talmud resonates to me i hear god through the voice and actions of other people very often um and um and that's where I learn a lot. You know, of course, I learn through Talmud and Torah study and stuff like that. But really, where I learn, when I see the presence of God, feel the presence of God, is through the actions and words of other people. Um, and it's very powerful. It's a very powerful way to try and perceive God. Any other questions? All right. Well, we dove in head first. Uh, to all of this, and um, and we'll 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 continue to to talk about this and to you know my, your homework for for this week is to to think about those moments in your life that may be transformative or transitional, right? Sometimes it's not even transformative; it's just transitional. But when you're sort of in a rut, when you're going down one way, you know it 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 takes us, you know. That's inertia. You continue to move in that direction until another force acts on you. So what is that other force that acts on us to get us out of that inertial rut that we have? Entropy. Well, entropy is one answer. God may be another one. (laughs) All right, my friends, have a wonderful, wonderful week. And- Thank you. um, I will see you. Uh, I can't Shabbos, believe it's eleven thirty here, call. and I stayed awake. I know. You're, you're right, a trooper. Good. <laughs> this is you very a, interesting. You get a participation trophy. Yeah, Peter's yes. on the East Coast. <laughs> Peter's on the East Coast. He gets the late night version of, or the, the, late, the late night award. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.